So the last time we looked at the book of Ruth, we came to the point where Boaz was undertaking for Ruth. So Ruth and her mother-in-law Naomi had found herself in a destitute place, without provision, without any male leadership or any male protection over them. And the Lord had led them back to Bethlehem, but they'd still no provision. But what we say is, whenever we are in need, that the Lord undertakes for us. And behind the scenes, the Lord was making sure that they were going to be under, um, under protection, that they were going to be provided for. And we've seen that Naomi had remembered that they had a near kinsman in Boaz. And we see that Boaz, when, Naomi, when Ruth came to Boaz, he took on that mantle, that he took charge of the situation, that he would redeem her. But there was a stumbling block in place. There was a nearer kinsman to the family than Boaz. So Boaz had went to the city gate to find this other nearer kinsman to see if he would take charge of the situation. And we've seen the last time in our study that he refused. And he pointed to Boaz and said, no, you do it, I'm not willing. So what we looked at the last time, we've seen that Boaz stepped in. Although the nearer kinsman should have been the person to redeem the situation, Boaz said, I'm here, I will do it. And what we looked at was the fact that the law can point us to the one who can fully redeem. That the law would have been fulfilled through the nearer kinsman, this unnamed man that we've seen in chapter 4, but he wasn't willing, he couldn't undertake that transaction. But Boaz, as our Christ figure, steps in and he says, I will do it. So we see that both Boaz and Christ are willing to make a sacrifice for us. They are willing to undertake and provide for us in all areas of our life. Jesus does it because he wants a bride. He wants us, the Christian church, as his Gentile bride. The same as Boaz was going to take Ruth to be his bride as well. So Boaz says, yes, I will redeem the family, the family land of Elimelech. I will redeem the land, but I will also redeem the family, and I will take a bride from the family as well. So this transaction is going on at the city gate and all the elders, the kind of ten elders that had called together to witness this transaction are looking on and they witness that this transaction has taken place, that he is redeeming the situation. So in chapter 4, verse 9, it says, Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, all that was Kilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. So what we see is that Boaz has purchased Ruth openly at the city gate in front of all of the people there, just as Jesus bought us. He bought us as his Gentile bride in front of the whole world. He died a public death on the cross, witnessed by many people, so that he could buy us, the same as Boaz did for Ruth in the situation here. So the ten elders witnessed that the law was ineffective, and Boaz stepped in and he overcame the law. We've got Galatians 3, verse 24, which says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified through faith. So Boaz steps in, and he, he is the one that can justify and can redeem this situation. And right through the book of Ruth, we've always said, we need to look at Boaz as this Christ figure in the account here. So the ten elders witness two things. First of all, they witness that the closer relative can't redeem, and is not willing to redeem. And secondly, the witness that the finger was pointed at Boaz, and he was the one that could undertake and redeem the full situation. And he does. So in verse 10 it says, Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Marlon, I have acquired as my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from amongst his brethren, from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. So Boaz is standing there and he confidently and boldly proclaims that he has made this transaction. It is done. He's bought the land. He's redeemed the land and all the family name, everything that comes with that. And he also takes the family of Elimelech that's left behind under his wing. And more than that, he's actually obligated to marry Ruth, to make Ruth his wife as well. And to have a child by her deceased husband's name, which we've looked at in more detail before. So basically, Boaz has undertaken all the aspects of the law. He's the only one that is able to do it. And what we see here, that Boaz doesn't do it because he has to, or he's been forced to, or he feels guilty to do it. He is delighted. He's awed to do this. It's the thing that's on his heart to do it. He desperately wants to redeem the situation and to redeem Ruth. 
So as we see the willingness of Boaz to do that here, again it pictures the Lord Jesus, what he does for us as well. And we're told in 1 Timothy 2, 4, that he desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's the desire of his heart, the same as the desire of Boaz's heart. He wants to redeem all mankind, but we have to come to him first and lay ourselves down at the feet of Jesus. So Jesus wants to redeem, and he's paid the ultimate cost to redeem us for every life that will put their self down at his feet as well and open their lives up to him. That is what's on his heart, the same as Boaz had a heart for Ruth. Boaz was interested in the bride and not the land, but the nearest kinsman was only interested in the land and not the bride. And we think of the Lord Jesus today. He created the world. Why did he do that? It wasn't because he needed the world and the trees and the fish and all these things as an expression of his love. But out of the world he wanted to take a bride. We are the pinnacle. It's us that he's after. Every soul that's on this earth he wants to save and redeem. So we see that Boaz redeems both the property and the family of Elimelech. And the cherry on the cake is he gets Ruth as his wife. And we looked at in previous studies, it was kind of heart to heart. The kind of character that Ruth had drew Boaz to her, and the character that Boaz had drew Ruth to him. They were kind of made for each other in some aspect. A wee attempt at humour here. Just have to put that out. This is a humorous statement. Before Boaz was married, he was ruthless. Get that? I thought I'll need to say it's humour because you probably wouldn't get it. So Boaz was brideless. He had no bride to share his life with. And Ruth was husbandless, being a widow. So these two lonely people find each other together in this union of marriage. And before Boaz takes Ruth to be his wife, he knew exactly who Ruth was. All of her background, everything about her life. He knew her life story, her condition, her need that she was poor and in poverty, that she was at the bottom of the pile. That she had a lot of baggage. But he was willing to take on board her her baggage and help her to unpack. He was wanting to redeem and restore her personally, the same as the Lord wants to redeem and restore all of our situations personally as well. He also knew that her people were Moabites, the enemies of Israel. He knew that and he still wanted her. Nothing stopped Boaz from redeeming Ruth in this account here. The other kings and the nearest, closest relative was unwilling but Boaz was more than willing to undertake in the full situation here. And what we can maybe take into account as well, that maybe Boaz knew what it was like to be in Ruth's situation. He could maybe sympathise with Ruth's situation. The kind of stigma of her background as a Moabite person, or stigma as a poor person, whatever it might be, I think that he had a heart for that. We can even look to the background of Boaz. His background is more than squeaky clean in some aspects, his mother was Rahab the harlot that we read of in Joshua chapter 2. So maybe he wasn't caring about staying in his family name because he knew the stigma that that would maybe take or maybe had in his past. He could understand what Ruth would feel like and he wanted to write that for her. But even when we go back to Rahab the harlot, you know, she's mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. She's not swept away to the side. You're too embarrassing. You're too, you're too sinful. You can't be redeemed. We look at Matthew chapter 1 and she's mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. Everyone who's redeemed has a part in the family of God. God is not ashamed of any of us because if he redeems us, the past is wiped away. And even if we look at Rahab the harlot, she was redeemed from that situation there. Due to her faith, she was redeemed. The same as Ruth was going to be redeemed in chapter 4 here as well. We read in James chapter 2.25, it tells us, In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodgings to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. She had a heart for, the, for God's people. She put her faith into action. And it says that she was considered righteous for the actions that she took in the book of Joshua. And where does she appear as well? She appears in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew. We've got the faith chapter of the Bible, which is Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith in the Bible. And we see in verse 11 that she is also mentioned there. And it says in Hebrews 11:31, By faith the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. 
So she is named as a righteous person and a faithful person because it didn't matter what her background was, that she moved on from it with God and God redeemed her. So Boaz would know what it would be like to have a stigma of a bad family name. That kind of background that you maybe can't shake off, that always kind of drags behind you. He could identify with the plight of Ruth here. But just like his mother Rahab, Ruth came to faith and was considered righteous. And that is us as well. Whatever our background is, however dark or dirty or sinful, when we come to God we are considered righteous. And we can put our name in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11 as well. Because we are the righteous in God. We are clothed in the righteousness of Jesus. So both Boaz and we can even see Jesus. They're both brought into this world by human mothers, human sinful mothers. And from his own mother's perspective, Boaz having the mother of Rahab, he knows the power of redemption. He knows what it's like. He's seen it in his mother's life, how she was redeemed. There was a power in this redemption here. And we, as we walk through this life, we need to understand the power of redemption for us and also the power of redemption for everyone else out there in the world that we come across. We are to look at people knowing the power of redemption that can happen in their lives. How often do we look at someone and we think, oh, you're, you're too, too far gone, or you're too bad, I want nothing to do with you. But how does Jesus see them? He doesn't say, oh, you're a Moabite person, get out of the way. We need to look at people through the eyes of Jesus the righteousness that they might have through God and the power that he can have in their lives to turn them round again. Jesus has eyes of compassion and care for everyone. We need to have the same. When we deal with people, whether it's at work or in the street in a shop, eyes of compassion to see what the power of redemption can do in somebody else's life if they come to Jesus. So with that regard, whoever comes through that door there should be welcome in this church. No one should be excluded at all. Too often you might think, what if somebody comes in and they sit down with our, you know, we can, through, we can come through with all these different scenarios. Well, if we are uncomfortable with somebody that comes through because they're sinful, they're in a, a, a wrong relationship, they're still welcome to sit down and be in this church. We need to put the message over to them and give them a chance to respond to the gospel message of God. Jesus came to make dead people alive, not to make bad people good. And too often we look at people thinking, you're too bad, you need to be made good. We actually need to get them saved first of all, and then things start to change after that point. So Boaz was this man of care and compassion for Ruth. We need to be the people of care and compassion to other people out with our sphere of this fellowship as well. And we need to catch people where they are. We're not going to catch perfect Christian good people. We're going to catch people in the world that are caught in sin. And it will be a process to get them from A through to being closer to God. We need to be willing to take that on board and to be willing to stand side by side with somebody and help them with that process. So no one's too sinful or too damaged or too hard to love or too difficult to redeem. Jesus' blood is more powerful than all of that. And he wants to redeem you and he wants to redeem me and everyone out there. And when he does, the old person, the old man is swept away. The old man is gone. And we're given a new identity in Jesus, a child of God. That is our new identity. Whatever is in the background is gone, it's past, it's dead and it's buried. We are new creations in God. And what we see here is what does Boaz do for Ruth? He gives her a new identity here. Everything that she went through in the background is wiped out, it's dead and it's buried. And she is given a new identity through her relationship with him. If you look back through even just chapter 4, I think it's about verse 5, verse 10. You know, it's Ruth the Moabite person, Ruth the Moabite person, Ruth the foreigner. She's always given, this is Ruth but her past, Ruth but her past, Ruth but her son. And what we see here in chapter 4 is, it's turned round. Because of the transaction that Boaz makes, that past identity is wiped away. It is dead and it is buried. And God will forgive us and he will bury our past as well. Ruth's background is considered gone as soon as she is united with Boaz here. And the point we have to understand as well is that nothing takes the Lord by surprise. Even the things that we hide from other people, we might even try to hide from ourselves, God knows about it. And even those things are too shameful to mention, he can redeem them also. But like Ruth had to do, 
you have to lay it at the feet of Jesus, lay it at the feet of Jesus, the greater Boaz in the gospel account. At the end of the day, God is the one that formed us. Sin deforms us, but only Jesus can transform us. And as we go through our daily walk with Christ, we are being renewed day by day by day. Jesus is the only one that can transform our lives, but we have to partner with him in that regard. Ask him and allow him to do that work. Jesus is the only one who is able. So he's going to take Ruth from ruin to redemption. From all the dark background that she had, he's going to redeem her circumstances here. And he's going to do it compassionately and willingly, just as the Lord will do it for us as well, out of a heart of compassion and willingness on our behalf. So Ruth's difficult background is going to be fully redeemed. And not only that, she's going to be included in the family of Israel as well. This pagan woman is going to be included in the family of Israel. In verse 11 it says, And the people who were at the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel, and make you prosper in the Fathra and be famous in Bethlehem. So obviously all this is going on at the, the city gate, you know, where people are coming and going, this transaction is taking place, there's Boaz, there's the, the closest kinsmen, there's the ten men that Boaz has gathered together to be witnesses. And not only that, we can see the town, oh, there's something going on here, same as we are down, down Russia, not Russia, down Kirkwood Main Street. If you see a wee crowd, you gather a crowd, and the crowd gets bigger and bigger. So what we see here, there's a crowd gathering because something's going on and people are nosy. And it's all the people and the elders are witnessing this transaction here. And what we see is this transaction that Boaz has undertaken and meets with approval with everyone that's there. Bear in mind that everyone knows about Ruth. The whole town knew about Ruth and her virtuous character. Boaz was a man of um, prestige in the community. He was an elder, he was a, uh, an employer and he looked after all these workers. So there are two people that are prominent. And they're coming together in unity. And everyone is approving what is going on here because they see it as a good match that's going to take place. So the people are gathered offer blessings for the couple and wish them well in their union together. And we see there's blessings of prosperity prayed over Boaz and Ruth at the city gate here. But what we also see is what is said is not just a kind word. It's actually a bit of a prophetic word as well, because everything that the townspeople pray over them and bless them with actually comes to fulfilment later on in the story. So what we can consider is that when we pray for people, when we pray blessings into somebody else's life, that we are interceding for them, we're standing in that gap, and we're asking the Lord to move and to undertake for them. And that's a mighty, a mighty important thing that we can do for other people. So the people pray, may the Lord make this woman like Rachel and Leah who built up the house of Israel. So Rachel and Leah were Israel's founding mothers, so to speak, that out of these two women came the twelve tribes of Israel. So they literally gave birth to the nation of Israel. So here we have the women, these people in the town, praying for Ruth, the Moabite, the arch enemy of Israel, coming from this pagan background, that this Ruth would be like the two most famous women in Israel. So we see that gap between the Gentiles and the Jews coming together, kind of grafting together, starting to take place. And it was a prayer for them to be fruitful in their relationship, to prosper in a fathra. And a fathra means the fruitful place. That's what that word means, that town means, the fruitful place. So where did, they, where did we find them off, first of all, in chapter 1? They were in Moab. And Moab was a place of death. Elimelech died, Malon died, Kilion died. And what we see is if we follow God, if we allow God to direct our paths, just as Ruth and Boaz will discover here, our relationships will be in a fruitful place if we follow God's direction. Ruth had been in Moab and she knew that where God wasn't, Moab, this kind of pagan place where she should never have been with Naomi, that that was a place of death. There was no fruit that actually was birthed there. But if she would move in God's path, if she would obey God's word, there'd be fruit coming from the relationship that she had with Boaz. And what we see is whether we are in a fruitful place or whether we are in a place of death comes down to us and the decisions that we make. We can choose to follow God's path or we can choose to follow the path that's opposite to God's. 
only one will lead to a fruitful outcome in our lives. And we see that both Ruth and Boaz here were going to come together in marriage, in union before God. And we need to think, you know, marriage is right throughout the Bible. Today's culture, we see marriage as being something that's non-essential, something that's on the back burner. Maybe a kind of good to do, but not essential. What we see here is that marriage is instituted by God. It's a pledge in front of other people to commit yourself and cleave one to another in unity, in the law, but also before God. And that is what Ruth and Boaz were going to do here. But importantly is that aspect of doing it in front of witnesses, in front of other people. And together we seek God's blessing on our lives. Together we seek God's fruitfulness in that relationship. And we're looking for other people to pray for us, for fruitfulness and blessings to happen in our life. At the end of the day, a relationship out with God's boundaries might survive, but it's only going to be the best it can ever be with God in the middle of it, to be in that total fruitful place with God, hand of blessing upon a relationship. So this blessing was that God would give them children to build up the house of Israel, and also prayed for fame and significance in the land of Bethlehem for Ruth and Boaz. And what we'll see in later verses is the fact that through the family line, through their children, we see King David coming, and through King David is the line of the Messiah Jesus coming as well. So Bethlehem is put on the map. If Naomi never went back to Bethlehem, then King David wouldn't be born there, and then Jesus wouldn't be born there either. But God's hand has been through all of the story, all of the account in the book of Ruth. So next to say in verse 12, May your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So another blessing upon them was that their house would be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. So who is this Perez person? And the story of his birth is actually spelled out in Genesis 38. Perez was the illegitimate son of Judah and Tamar. So Tamar was married to one of Judah's sons, but he died and she was left without any sons, without a husband, kind of in the same place that Ruth was left in the book of Ruth here as well. So Judah's Judah's oldest son would have the duty of marrying her, having a child to her and raising up a child, but he refuses. So she is left penniless, destitute as well. Nobody is looking after her. So it's a bit of an unsavory story, as many of the accounts in the Old Testament are. She dresses up as a prostitute, stands by the side of the road, and she bumps uglies with her father-in-law, and she bears a child. Okay, so it's an illegitimate son with her father-in-law. And what we see is that he doesn't have any money to pay for her, and he gives her, he gives her his signet ring. And it comes out in the wash that he actually is the father of her child. And the baby's name is Perez. But what we see is that through that, even though it's quite a sordid story, that account as well is redeemed that Perez is in the genealogy of Jesus as well, that he is mentioned through this, and Tamar is also vindicated also. She was a Canaanite woman. She wasn't a Jewish person, wasn't an Israelite, but God saw fit for the line to be continued through her, the same as the line was going to be continued through Ruth and Boaz as well. And through her son Perez, the tribe of Judah comes, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows. And the line of the tribe of Judah is Jesus, that that was a very, very important line and had to grow and had to actually perpetuate throughout the generations. And Boaz was also of the line of Judah as well. So quite an interesting one as as well here. He was an illegitimate son. And we're told in Deuteronomy 23 verse 2, one of illegitimate birth shall not enter into the assembly of the Lord even till the tenth generation. So for ten generations after Perez being born, they couldn't come and lead worship in the temple. Who was the tenth generation? It was King David. So see that God's hand is upon everything. King Saul would never have been the chosen king for the people of Israel because he was of the Benjamin tribe. God had never said that there was going to be a tribe of Benjamin, but somebody from the tribe of Judah would sit on the throne of Israel. And we see that in the book of Micah, I think it is. So this town is praying blessings upon blessings upon Ruth and Boaz, and fruitfulness does actually come into play, that they are fruitful in their relationship. Judah's line is preserved through them, and it results in the house of David, 
and ultimately end the birth of the Messiah as well. And what we see is that God is expanding his family with Israel people, with Jews, but also with Gentile foreigners as well. And this is the way that God knew it would always end up. We've got the words to Abraham in Genesis 12. I will make you into a great nation, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. And we start to see that happening through the book of Ruth here, that the Jew and the Gentile are coming into this kind of grafting together. So God's Israelite family was always going to be huge, but we see here it's starting to reach out into other nations, into other people groups as well. And we are the Gentiles, if we are born again this morning, we are included in the family of God. And we see the many accounts of that throughout the Bible here. As believers, we become in his family as well. So whoever we are this morning, however good we are, however bad we are, it doesn't matter. Whatever our background is, it's of no account. God can redeem and save all people. And we see that in this account here. Prostitutes, the sinful, the dark, the people that never knew God and their family generations before, we can all be redeemed if we sit at the feet of Jesus and accept him for who he is. So in verse 13 it says, Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. Then he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. So interestingly, Rachel and Leah that we've seen in the previous verse, they were unable to conceive until the Lord opened their wombs and allowed them to become pregnant. It was the Lord's hand on their lives that, that allowed them to become pregnant. And we compare that to Ruth here as well. This is her second marriage. Her husband before died in the land of Moab. They were perhaps there for about ten years, something like that. So they were married and for many years they were not fruitful in their relationship in Moab. That she was not able to conceive a child. So the townspeople here are praying for, Bo- for Ruth and Boaz here. That they know her background through her first marriage that she didn't have a child. And they're praying that the Lord would undertake for her and that they would have a child now. So they pray that God would actually move in their situation. And what we see is that God is the one that blesses the seed. God is the one that gives conception. Conception is a demonstration of God's power. And we can even look at the account of the Virgin Mary being pregnant by the Holy Spirit, that that was a move of God's hand upon Mary, that Jesus was conceived upon an act of God, the same way as Ruth was going to conceive through an act of God here as well. It's always God that's at work in all of our circumstances, whether we want to realise it or not, that God is always putting things together, the pieces of the jigsaw, to make that big, larger plan. Through all the bitter setbacks of Naomi and Ruth in the account here, God is at work through all of the dark times. And sometimes when we're going through a dark tunnel, we just don't see the light. We just need to have confidence that the light is there and that God's going to bring us through to that end point. When she lost her husband and her sons, Naomi, God gave her Ruth. When she could think of no kinsman to redeem her family line, God raised up somebody in the family name through a child that Ruth and Boaz are going to have here. When Baron Ruth married Boaz, the child was given. Whatever the setback was, God undertook for them. And the point of the story that's been made through here is that the life of the godly is not without bumps in the road. But through the bumps in the road, God will still undertake and God will make sure we get to that end destination that we need to get to. He will undertake for all of us in our situations. So Ruth chapter 1, it began with three funerals. And now we've got a wedding and we've got a baby being born, as we will see in the next few, few verses. So I think I said in kind of the first time I looked at this book, it's a kind of good chick flick content. So three weddings, a baby and a funeral. No, three funerals, a wedding and a baby. It could be quite a good title in a DVD box. So for years, Ruth has been barren in her first marriage. And now she comes into this new relationship with God's hand of blessing upon her. And we'll see that fruitfulness is going to be birthed out of their relationship. From a place of emptiness to a place of fullness, she is now in a fruitful place because God's hand is upon them and they have moved under God's provision. God will bring us from a place of life out of death. When we think we're in a dark, deathful place, God will undertake for us and will bring us through to a better point in our lives. And Ruth the Moabite person, she's now Ruth Boaz's wife. 
She's got a new identity through the relationship that she has with him. Her scorn as a Moabite person has been totally removed. She's been redeemed and made new. And she's got to have a child. And children are a gift from God. We've got Psalm 127 verse 3. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. She's got to be rewarded for following God's path, for having the faith to follow God, wherever God is leading her. She could have stayed in Moab, but she didn't. She followed where God was leading. The same way as we need to follow where God is leading in our lives, whether it's in a small thing or a big thing, that he will bless us for following after him. So as marriage, we can see the union of marriage is the closest thing we have on earth to symbolise our relationship with the Lord. It's a challenging thing to think that we are the Lord's bride on this earth here, that we, as the church of God, are the bride of Christ. The Lord wants to be involved in all aspects of our life, just as every married couple should share in all aspects of their life. Imagine Ruth getting married to Boaz, but refusing to let him into any certain parts of her daily life. Would that make for a good relationship? No. They'd end up quite miserable. And it would be a pretty dire romance story as well. You know, the marriage would go down the swan if that was the case. So if their union wasn't full in all aspects of life, it would not be a good outcome. And for us, if we are not open with God, if we are not sharing our full life with him, then that is wrong as well. And we are not getting come into the fullness that we could potentially have with him. It doesn't fit the story here in Ruth. And for us as believers, as for followers of Jesus, it shouldn't follow in our story either. Do we need to share all things with God and invite him into all areas of our life? So Boaz takes Ruth as his bride. And interestingly, this word took means to carry away or to fetch. That the plan of redemption in the life of Naomi and Ruth, he has to take her as his bride in order for the plan to continue on to be fulfilled. He pays the price for Ruth, and then he carries her away with him to be his betrothed. The Lord's plan of redemption will be nearer completion when he, the Lord Jesus, comes back to this earth, and he takes us as his bride to be with him. That is the next step in this plan of redemption that we are waiting on. But as we stand here now, as his bride, we need to keep ourselves close to him, constantly seeking his face, keeping under his protection, and loving him and allowing him to love us back. And I believe that he will carry us away. He will catch us away when he comes to take his church with him. And now we're in that period of waiting, this period of grace, this waiting period, we get a responsibility to share the gospel with other people, to grow his bride, to grow his church. And just now, his plan has been worked out. While we are allowed to input into that plan, we've got that responsibility here. But for the believer, we're accepted in Jesus, just as Ruth was accepted in Boaz. She was redeemed and a legal transaction took place. He was the redeemer and Ruth was totally redeemed from her past. And the Bible reminds us that no matter what our past is, when we can come to Jesus, he forgives, he forgets, and we are fully redeemed from all of our background story as well. Jesus completed the transaction at the cross, and we need to apply that into our lives and the daily business as well. The land of Naomi was bought back, just as Jesus buys back this earth in Revelation chapter 5 as well. And we are waiting for that day where Jesus comes to take us to be with him. He's going to take us and carry us away with him. And that is the hope that we have when we are sitting here today. That is the light at the end of any dark tunnel which we have. We know that he is coming and he's going to take us to be with him. So in verse 14, the women say to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative. And may his name be forever famous in Israel. And we too should be able to echo that this morning. Blessed be the Lord, because he undertakes for us. He is our Redeemer. He has not left us destitute and empty. He brings fullness into our lives. And one day, he's not only going to be famous in Israel, he's going to be famous across the whole earth. When the whole earth have to bow the knee to him and recognise him for who he truly is. So this child is going to be born through Boaz and Naomi. 
And this child is going to be so important because out of this child is the line of King David and out of this child is the line of Jesus, the Messiah. And we can even bring that down to base level to our daily lives as well. The children that we might have as a couple, our physical children, or even the children within our our fellowship, what part might they play in the kingdom of God? You know, when we're standing here this morning, we're sitting, we don't actually know what part they're going to play. But this be baby Obed, there's no way that Ruth or Naomi would think he's going to be the descendant of Jesus and all this kind of stuff. We don't know the great things that our children might be able to do. But if God's hands upon them, they will bring fruit for the kingdom of God in their life if they follow God's ways. And we need to be praying for our own children and the children of our fellowship as well. And this union of Ruth and Boaz would have a far-reaching significance through their child. And through our relationships with each other, we can have a far-reaching significance as well. When we pull together as a body, bringing all of the gifts of each individual person together, and we move as one person, we can achieve so much for God, if only we would come together in unity under his name. So the women are rejoicing with Naomi. The account starts with Naomi in chapter 1, and it's only right that it ends with Naomi in chapter 4 as well. Naomi was a person who decided to get herself right with God. She'd moved with her husband out with God's protection to the land of Moab, somewhere where she should have never been. But she changed it around and she moved back to the land of God, back to Bethlehem. Through her choice to turn her life around, we see all of this account of Ruth taking place. Redemption is possible because she turned her life around and she looked to God. We can see what God can do through one person that turns their life to him, that they allow God to do a mighty work through them and through the relationships which they have. She had hard times, she was bitter, but she didn't let it stop her permanently in her life. She got herself sorted, she looked to God, and she moved where God was calling her, back to the land where he promised to look after her. When we are bitter in our lives, we can be bitter for a wee while, but it comes to the point we need to bite the bullet and turn back to God. God, I've had enough being bitter, we hand it back over to him. And when we do, he restores us, he redeems us, and he brings a fullness out of the dark time that we are in. So verse 15 says, May he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For you, daughter, for you, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. So the townspeople are saying to, to Naomi that this son that's going to be born, he shall be a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. He was going to turn all of their circumstances around. Through this little baby, he was the one who's going to redeem everything, redeem the full family line here. Just as Jesus would be born in Bethlehem as well, and he would redeem all things. Jesus would be a restorer of life for all mankind. And Ruth, when Ruth was standing beside Naomi when they moved back to Bethlehem, Naomi says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara, I'm bitter. I'm coming back with nothing. And Ruth standing by her side, and Ruth thinking, I'm here. I love you, I've clung, clung to you, I came with you, what do you mean I'm nothing? Yet we see here that she's been considered better than a son. She's better to you than seven sons. Seven sons being the complete best family in Israel you could ever have. That she is better than seven sons to Naomi. That everything that Naomi has required in her life, Ruth has met it over and above. So things may go wrong in our lives, but God can see to it that everything is restored. Even if at some point we're considered a nothing, it makes nobody's something. What's the wee thing we normally have in the front of us? A wee print out in this church? Everybody is somebody and, and Jesus is Lord. So everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. In the kingdom of Jesus, in the family of God, everyone is somebody. We've all got worth in his eyes. So in verse 16, to very quickly wrap up, then Naomi took the child and laid him in her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbour, women, came to him, gave to him a name, saying, This is a son born to Naomi, and they called him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. So Ruth and Boaz have the baby, and the women of the town interestingly give him a name. Don't know why they gave him a name, it's maybe a kind of 
um, Israel thing, I'm not quite sure, but they call him Obed, and Obed means the serving one or the worshipping one. So after being redeemed, Ruth has been this Gentile bride, brings out of herself worship and service. So a birth out of her relationship, out of her marriage relationship with her Redeemer comes worship and service. We, as the redeemed bride of Jesus, out of us we should have worship and service also. And we can apply that to our own daily lives. It doesn't just mean come to church on a Sunday, but in our daily lives, how do we worship God and how do we serve him? Naomi was blessed by God through this child, and the generations that were going to be succeeded were going to be blessed as well, because King David would be raised up, the biggest and greatest king that Israel would ever have, and further down, King Jesus would be raised up as well, the restorer of all things for all mankind. Obed would be King David's grandfather, and Ruth would be David's grandmother in this account. So the wee boy changes everything in this story here. And through the lineage, Jesus is born. If all this didn't take place in Ruth, there would be a block on that lineage taking place there. So verse 18 says, Now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Abinadab, Abinadab begot Nashon, Nashon begot Salmon, Salmon begot Boaz, Boaz begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. So the book began at the time of the judges for everyone done right in their own eyes, and it ends up pointing to the fact of King David, God's appointed person, the man after God's own heart being raised up as king. So it started when people were doing their own thing to God raising up a king to look after the nation of Israel. And what we see throughout that genealogy there and through the genealogy of Matthew, that we've got noble lines and we've also got ennoble lines as well. So we've got Isaac and Rebecca, we've also got Judah and Tamar, you know, the good people and we've got the bad people in the lineage here. And what we see is that nobody, as I said, is excluded. Everybody has a redeemer through Jesus Christ that we can all be redeemed and renewed. And God wants us to know that if we follow him, our lives also mean a lot more than we think they do. Through the daily aspects of our life, through the tiny, tiny, small choices that we make, God is weaving a greater tapestry together. And we don't know the impact of the daily choices which we make, that God can do something huge with them. Everything that we do in obedience to God, no matter how small, is significant to him. And he will bless that and he will bring fruit into our lives if we do that. God's love and his grace has got the power to overcome all things. Only though, when it's handed over to him, we have to invite him to come in and to take control. So from eternity, God had planned to bring Ruth and Boaz together, to make Bethlehem the entrance point for Jesus, the true kings and redeemer, to come into the world. For him to be fully God and fully man, to be able to restore everything to be a restorer of life for all mankind. There's many, many things in the book of Ruth that we've not even covered. It's one of those ones, there's a top story, there's a beneath story, there's about 20 different stories underneath. But just to leave with this point here, it started off with the loss of sons, and it ends up with the women shouting, Naomi has a son. It starts with a famine, and it ends up with an abundance of grain. It starts off with bitterness, and it ends up in blessing. We have a redeemer, the same as Ruth had here. We might be bitter, like Naomi is, sitting here this morning. We might be a wee bit further away from God than we should be, like Ruth at one point was as well. But what this book shows us is that God can turn all things around when we look to him and we follow him. Spiritually, we need to come back to Bethlehem to allow him to be a restorer to our life, to be a restorer of our souls and a nourisher of our faith as well. So let us be like Ruth, a faithful one who loves God deeply and clings on to God. To be a person like Boaz, a person of integrity, who knows the word of God, who shows strength, but also care and compassion to other people. Be like Naomi, that she is deeply loved by other people, and she receives God's unexpected blessings in her life when she looks to him and hands things over to God. God wants us to know him as a provider, in all aspects of our life, and that he can bring life out of death. 
Jesus loves us so much he wants us to be his bride and we should be living like it in our daily lives if we have cleaved to God. And he wants us to know that the Holy Spirit is with us, within us, and is working out all aspects of our life as well, in quiet and unseen ways, the same as he did in the book of Ruth here as well. So we need to have faith in that and look and listen to the voice of God as well. So let's just close in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this account of Ruth here within your holy word. We thank you, Father God, for the encouragement that, Lord God, you are sovereign over all things. That you are our kinsman redeemer. You are able to bring life out of death and abundance out of a destitute situation. If we're in a bitter, dark point, Father God, that you can turn that around and bring life and vitality once again. We recognise, Lord God, that we go through all different situations in our lives. Some are easy and some are difficult. For anyone that's sitting here this morning going through a difficult situation, Father God, we just pray, Lord God, that you would undertake in all aspects of that. That each and every one of us, Lord, would know your hand at work behind the scenes. That you would raise up people and people in situations and actions, Father God, that can bring a restoration to the hard times that we are having just now. The Lord God, you would speak into our lives and into the lives of those round about us, Lord. And you would bring us into a fruitful place. We are maybe feeling barren and unfruitful at this moment in time, Lord God, that you can change all that around. We submit ourselves under your Lordship this morning. We ask you, Lord God, to be Lord of our lives, to be King over all aspects of our daily lives, Father. Like Ruth lay at the feet of Boaz, we sit ourselves at your feet. And we ask you to undertake for us. We hand everything over to you, Lord God. And we get confidence that you, who started off a good work in us, Father, will bring it to completion. We trust you for this, Lord, and we worship you and we thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen.